Everyone's got opinions when it comes to leadership. And let's be honest, how many experts do we all know? But where can we find real leadership advice that's not BS? Well, look no further. Welcome to No BS Leadership, where on each episode, we attempt to expose the gap between what leaders think they should be doing and what actually works. Listen in as we irritate some, inform others, and challenge all leaders to discover a better path to the leadership excellence we all want. I know Myra's a big fan of Stephen Covey, but my favorite leader, John Luke Picard, said, Engage and get her done. I have a question for you guys right out of the box. And before we get started, I'm Aquarius. welcome. <laughs> Welcome to another episode of No More Leadership BS. And I am here with the three Jeffs, Jeff and Geoff and Dr. Sam. And we are just thrilled to be back here with you again and thrilled that you're listening. So we had a really heavy episode last time. It was a great episode. We got to dig into a lot of things. I want to take it another step further. So I want you to imagine for a minute that you are at the the water cooler with one of your colleagues and you're having a conversation and you're debating what's going on in the world right now and throwing out this and throwing out that. And all of a sudden it, it turns sour. Somebody says, I can't believe that you could stomach that kind of stuff or believe that kind of stuff. And all of a sudden the gloves come on and before you know it, Your conversation has turned into a battle and it just degrades from there. And this is a very common occurrence, especially in today's world. But what just happened? What just (laughs) happened? Sorry. The ugly defensive monster raised its head. But how did that happen? I know every one of us has gotten into that situation. But what I want to talk about today is... What does defensiveness do to our conversations and how does it keep us from having real conversations that get problems solved and the other way is getting into a boxing match that where nobody wins? Geoff. Okay. When you said defensive conversations, I immediately go to your brain goes into fight or flight mode because your brain doesn't recognize the difference between like reality, like I'm being chased by a bear and in your mind, oh my gosh, I think I'm being chased by a bear and you're running through the woods and there's nothing there. Your brain doesn't recognize the difference. As long as your brain thinks that there's a bear and you're running from it, you're in fight or flight mode. So when somebody comes at you with an attacking statement or a, you know, something that makes you defensive, you automatically enter that fight or flight mode and it takes you out of your prefrontal cortex and you lose your executive functioning skills. Doesn't matter who you are on the planet. If it's a serious, really like accusatorial kind of a, an attack, you automatically go there. It's a human nature. And to try and get yourself back, you got to stop, breathe. Sometimes you got to like literally walk away from the situation before you can come back to it and think you have to have time to de-escalate, lower your heart rate, get rid of some of the cortisol that's now coursing through your system. And then you can enter your prefrontal cortex and start to actually think about what's going on. And so that if you have those conversations, if somebody comes at you and attacks, in terms of that, you you have limited choices because you're not going to be thinking clearly. You're automatically going to go into defensive mode. And that's just how it's going to happen. So if you are aware of it, if you can ask questions, wait, why would you say that? What about that is bothering you? If you have things that are like literally in your pocket, like I have these five questions that I can ask somebody that slows everything down or even two questions or one question that like allows you time to breathe and to deescalate your own system, your internal system, your nervous system, you can then start to actually have a conversation where you're not reactive, you're proactive, which is really hard to do. That, and that is so deep. The way our brain works, shutting off our ability to reason when we go into fight and flight is, if you can recognize that is, that's a first step to good communication. Something I heard, you just reminded me, something I heard of what you can say is when somebody attacks you, you can just say, tell me more. 
Tell me more. If you say nothing else, just tell me more. Yeah, I like And that. you'll get to a more reasonable approach. But I think it's more than just our verbal communication. So, Jeff Geyer, what are some things that we can do that we don't even realize we do that can send people into the defense mode? Because once defensiveness shows its ugly head, communication literally stops. It well, literally stops. So what yeah, are some of the other ways than just verbal attacks? Can we get people's defense mechanism going? Yeah, that, that's a great question, Myra. I believe that communication is at the root of all conflict that we have or lack of communication. Some challenge with communication is, is at the root of all these challenges. And it can be really simple things that we put under on the body language category. Roll your eyes, shrug your shoulders, sigh, cross your arms, look up into the sky, and shake your head back and forth. All of these things that tell the other person, you know what, I think you're full of crap Preach. or whatever, right? And so we get defensive. And when we get defensive, you're absolutely right. Communication ceases when we're defensive. When we get into a defensive mode, and we can use all kinds of analogies, the, the analogy of maybe a boxer or something. In defensive mode, their hands are up around their face, and they're just defending the old, I'm thinking about Muhammad Ali and the rope-a-dope, right? He, there's nothing happening. He's not doing anything. He's just protecting himself. So we're not trying to solve the problem. We're not trying to, in, in the rope-a-dope thing, he's maybe long-term, he's trying to win the fight, but it sure doesn't look like he's trying to win. He's not trying to make it any better. He's not trying to prove his point. He's just being. And so all of that body language stuff can force people to get into a very defensive posture, which surprisingly makes us want to be defensive as well because a lot of times unless you, you happen to be a jack wagon and there are a number of those people in society that then <laughs> when they see a defense thing they get more aggressive <laughs> which isn't going to help but as the leader we have to control or certainly be aware of our verbal so our words, but even more importantly, lots of studies show that our body language, those cues that we give off with our body and our eyes and our voice and stuff carry way more weight than what we're saying. Ob obtain a less aggressive stance if you feel somebody getting aggressive because you're right, communication ceases. And when that happens, all manner of conflict is going to get worse. Yeah, that's the root of it all. And when I said communication ceases, I want to amend that to say a communication that will resolve anything ceases because That's we're certainly right. communicating. You're communicating, just not getting what you want. Yeah. And you're likely not to get what you want if you continue down that road. As leaders, I think one of the times that we face re challenges with defensiveness is when they show up with a chip on their shoulder. And when are they most likely to do that? Review time. Review time is, that's almost instant defensive. Jeff Conroy, do you have any tricks and tips to put somebody at ease when it is a naturally defensive situation and you want to get rid of that right off the bat? And whiskey's he's not the answer, Jeff. Yeah, see, I was going to say I pull out a couple of highball glasses and <laughs> I've had to do that numerous times. I'm going to agree with Geyer. The way your body is can escalate a situation big time. And the way, especially your facial expressions can escalate too. The first thing you don't want to do is when something goes down is your first inclination is you might want to pimp slap somebody, but you don't want to do that. So to de-escalate a situation at a review, I've done my share of bad reviews. And one of the first things I've ever done is I never liked having a desk between me and the other person ever. I always like to have the open space between us. And I always have liked to have some type of a table where we could sit next to each other at the table and have a conversation. But like I said, I've never liked having a barrier between me and a coworker that I was giving a bad review or at any time. So I always would like to have a small table, sit and have that conversation. And you always start out with the positive stuff they're doing. Talk about the positive things they're doing. 
talk about what they're doing well, what's what they're doing right, and then go into, and these are the things you need to work on. I'd work on these things. These are the barriers that are holding you back. Can you tell me what you think some barriers are that are holding you back? And how do we fix those barriers and discuss those barriers and then have a plan of action moving forward to address those barriers and then come up with an agreed upon time to come back and let's have that conversation on how we're doing later and just check in on them. But I would, it would never be to me, having a desk in between two people is an authoritarian posture that I've never enjoyed ever. I've usually had a standing desk with a small table that when people want to come talk to me, we sit around the table. A round, a, a small round table. King Arthur yeah. had yep. it right. Yep. Um, small, a round table. Just like when you have big events, when we have big family get together, we always want a round table. We don't ever sit at a square table because or a rectangular table because you're leaving people out. So we sit at a very small table so we can all look at each other and talk. You're right. King Arthur was onto something. That's excellent. I think it, the less you can make people uncomfortable to start with, you, you've got control over them. And I think as leaders, we have to be really cognizant of how that affects other people. And, and it'll affect different people different ways. But if anybody that has control over you, you're not sure what they're going to do and what that's going to cause for your life. But I'm, I am a firm believer because I've really been working on this lately. I have a challenge with it, actually. And I've noticed that when defensiveness comes up, that all of a sudden we go from talking about what is right into who is right. And what do you say about that, Dr. Sam? There's a lot to that. And also, sometimes the what is right is the debate. And the what the people hold as their belief is at the core of that conversation. So you mentioned some of the things that have a lot of heat. Any topic that's being voted on, there's going to be people on either side. And there's values and beliefs and understandings, right? So arguing about that topic for some of those folks is exactly the same thing as arguing about the person. So if we can't extract ourselves from the topic at hand, it's going to very much be a person-to-person -person argument and debate rather than using that a topic as the third thing in the room and have a discussion about that. Now it's about how we see the world and my way is right and your way is wrong and better bring your shield and your sword because we're going at it now. It's very easy to get in that space. If you can stay in that third thing perspective, it's easier, but it's not easy to do. If you go in with the idea of fix the problem, not the person, it becomes less defensive. Start addressing the issue. Don't say and go, you are doing this wrong and you are doing this. If you make it personal, mm -hmm. then it's going to be a 10 round brawl. Do you think that word you needs to stay out of the conversation? Yeah. Unless What's you're talking? asking, what do you think about this? Or yeah. what is a solution that you would, Yeah. then it's okay. But if it's accusatory, when you do this. Que questions with what the word a person you in your situation, think about your stupid behavior. That's probably not yeah. the way to go. <laughs> that works. You Question missed that. Do you fix it? Yeah. Questions <laughs> with the word you in it are fine, but statements with the word you in it, not so fine. Now, nah. in the recent situation that I just have dealt with is I had to ask a question of somebody and I had to ask, what is the backup? And what is the backup plan? I didn't say, what is your backup plan? What is the backup plan? And it took a day to get a response. And the response was like, it was a whole page and it was full of them defending themselves. And it was just so obvious. And there was a couple statements in there. So what I did is I said, let's take what you would do and put it to the side for right now. Let's talk purely about the backup plan. And then we'll come back to what you would do about it later. And it was able to get it back into an even keel, if you would. And then the, the feelings were like put to the side. I wasn't going to be able to have a conversation with this person because they were obviously, they were ready for battle. They were standing, 
and the idea of the backup plan went out the window. It went out the window completely. It was not even being addressed. It is. It was all the whys and whys nots that I wasn't interested in. So wise if we nots. can wise knots, wise, wise knots. knots. That's a cubby. No, it isn't really. exactly would, wise not. It's an Indiana. It's an Indiana, it's an Indiana thing. <laughs> It's an Indiana thing, man. Go ahead. Go ahead. Point me out. Point me out. Now I'm going to get defensive, Conroy. But it is drinking. It is drinking time where you're at. I mean. And just hold this all together is what if we could meet this challenge and watch ourselves so that we don't put somebody into defensive mode, what kind of difference would that make in our organizations? And just go back to the water cooler situation. You were sitting there at the water cooler. You're discussing a situation as it is. It's completely benign. It has nothing to do with you or them. It's just a situation. And you roll your eyes and they take offense. And that's really what getting defensive is about, is you taking offense. So what happens if you never roll your eyes, you have a discussion, you disagree, you agree to disagree, and you go on to your different directions? How does that affect the culture, the, uh, the ability for somebody to want to talk to you next time? And heaven forbid that it, you no longer have negative conversations at the water cooler with other people describing how this person was being nasty to you. So why should we develop this skill? Why don't we just bully our way through and say, because this is the way it is, and that's, I'm the boss. Well, professionalism. You know, do mean, you know how many people, professionals? <laughs> yeah. Oh, I know. have that I, skill? I, I, Believe, yeah. I think the five of us are very familiar with that, how many people are not professional. And it's that, <laughs> people forget about that. It's be professional. It's not personal. It's business. And to have that. Strive to have a business conversation and not a personal conversation. For it's, that, it's good stuff, Conroy. For me, Myra, my leadership journey changed. My effectiveness as a leader changed when I learned or decided that as the leader, I didn't always have to be right. That whatever situation, whether it's around the water cooler or around the boardroom table, I didn't have to be right. I changed from this directive leadership style, if you could put it that way, to more of an inclusive one that my, my job as the leader wasn't to direct the organization. My job was to influence it. And I could influence it by not backing people yes. into corners, trying to get them to accept my position. When backing them into the corner, as we're talking here today, just makes them defensive. And now we're battling and we've even forgot sometimes what we're battling about. So I'm an influencer, not a director. And to influence people, I have to pay attention to their thoughts and feelings and actions and words before I consider my own. And you don't know it all. And, and you don't. And you no. don't. I just go back to we, we slip off of talking about what is right into who is right. And if you can remember that, if nothing else, as you're dealing in a defensive situation, diffuse it. Bring it back into what is right. At, if they're heavy into defensive, put that aside for a minute and go back to the subject. And then with the assurance, because you don't want to discount their feelings, we'll go back and visit that after we've solved the problem. And that's where I see the ugly head of it is a problem comes up. You want to talk about it. You want to talk about the steps to go forward. And they're heavy into, it was not my fault. If they hadn't done that over there, I wouldn't. They are defensive because it's a problem. Yeah, You don't even have to do anything. I like the one. They did that on purpose just to make me angry. No, they mm -hmm. first, maybe they did. But the truth is you have no idea what they were thinking. You can't control that. <laughs> Which nor, is can a, I, nor can that's we a whole accurately that's assess an, it. That's a whole nother episode. Yeah. Yeah. Now I'm all When we can read up, minds, we'll be fine. Yeah, but remember, it's not all about you. And what? and take, no, it's not, Conroy. I've been telling you this all along. <laughs> That's so wrong. I've been Contrary to your wife's beliefs, <laughs> which your wife thinks. There you go. You don't know it all, but you surround yeah. yourself with yeah. people who do like us. 
Thank you. Yep. But if nothing else, become aware of your words and how you say things and your body language. And more than anything, become aware of when they take it off of the subject about what is right into who is right and just pause right there. Separate it out and put it to the side and say, let's go back to our subject and we'll come back to that later. Anybody else have parting words on this? I know it's a deep one and I hope you think about it and I hope you start noticing. Practice the pause. The question of the backup plan, I've been thinking about that for just a couple minutes now. Asking somebody presents a plan, you say, okay, what's the backup? Which sounds like support, but can also sound like the plan's going to fail. So what's your plan B? So what I tend to do is if I read somebody's plan or idea and say, okay, I think I get it. I'm with you. And if this was to fail, where were the weaknesses that you see? Where are some ways that this might not go? Let's assume it's going to, but if it doesn't, what's that? What could that look like? And so we do a pre-mortem and a post-mortem. So if this dies, how's it going to die? And it, it tends to get us to look at the whole situation from a third perspective and look at the plan, not the person who made the plan, which tends to get things to a reasonable outcome. But you have to have two honest actors in the situation. If somebody's there just to be right, it ain't going to work, no matter how fluffy you put the language. Yeah. Are you saying we need two adults in the room? Is that what you're saying? That's not what I'm saying. You're saying <laughs> it. I will accept that. I think adults are worse at it than kids. So any, is there anything else somebody wants to add before we sign off for this episode? I love you. In our household, we sing a song that, uh, that goes something like this. I was right and you were wrong. That is why I sing this song. I told you, so. I told you, uh-uh, I told you so. And you have to have a song ready in case you were right. Or in case you were wrong, you can sing, you were right and I was wrong. And that is why I sing this song. So <laughs> song always helps everything. Yeah, I think we should I, close with that one. All right. I think that is, is what we should close on. If you struggled with this, if you notice people are defensive in your communication and you want somebody to help you with this, there is five of us here that would love to. And all you have to do is reach out. We're really easy to get a hold of. You can email us through ask us at leadershipbs.co. You can reach out on Facebook. And now on YouTube, either one, we will, one of us will respond, but you still get the pick of the litter. I'm, you don't have to take the luck of the draw. So if there is nothing else, I want to wish you all a great week. Keep your eyes open. Be aware. That's the first step of learning is to become aware and take it from there. And remember to take it back to what is right or what is the subject versus who is right. And you'll win every time. With that said, it is sign-off time, and it is bye-bye for this time, and we will be back next week to bring you more wisdom. Bye. Bye. Hasta luego.